Um, so I'm Russ McBride, who is running the speaker series and also giving today's talk. Um, this is going to be a talk about a different approach to understanding and training entrepreneurs that I call functional entrepreneurship. I want to give a shout out to um, a bunch of people at Utah, Rob Webker, um, Jay Barney, Todd Zanger, Tepo Flynn at Oxford, and others um, who helped develop some of these ideas. And a big thanks to the Philippines Economic Development Foundation, PhilDev, who gave me no less than 14 lectures in December, um, where I had plenty of opportunity to uh, practice sharpening these ideas. So um, if they're still unclear, it's definitely not their fault. It's not a good sign. OK, so the plan is to give you a little bit of background on who I am, for those of you who don't know me. Um, and then I want to focus in on this case study, the Microsoft IBM agreement, the famous agreement that launched Microsoft into the stratosphere. I want to talk about current views of entrepreneurship, uh, what social agreements are, and then exercises for teaching young entrepreneurs how to design social agreements. Um, so that's me. I've got a bunch of degrees in philosophy and cognitive science. I'm an assistant professor here. Oh, I should correct that according to the email that went out from Yolanda, who apparently has some powers I wasn't aware of. I have now achieved tenure and I'm an associate professor. So congratulations to me. Thanks, Yolanda. Um, I'm also the director of the Social Reality and Cognition Research Group, SORAC which looks at the question of what social entities are, especially institutions, organizations, and firms. And I work, worked really hard to get an all-star advisory board, including uh, Todd Sanger, uh, Jay Barney, one of the world's foremost strategy and entrepreneurship scholars, uh, Dimo Dimov from the UK, Brian Epstein, uh, an award-winning social ontologist, um, Elizabeth Pachary from Paris, uh, Mike Ryle from Toronto, Deb Tolleson, um, another really famous social ontologist, John Searle, who founded Social Ontology, Rob Webker, and Brian Gordon. Um, I work primarily in three research streams, entrepreneurship, uh, the foundations of social reality, and cognition. And in the past, I had a software company. I did a lot of real estate investing, mostly pretty poorly. Um, I was an AI researcher at the Lexington Institute with this guy over here, Jeff, over fun times. And I was an employee at Apple for exactly one day. Uh, the second day I woke up and decided it would be important to go for a really long run and I promptly got lost in San Jose, which I think was actually semi-intentional because I really didn't want to do that two and a half hour commute one way from Berkeley every day. So that was, uh, that was my sum total at Apple. Um, I was also the director of the Foundry Entrepreneurship Incubator associated with the University of Utah in Salt Lake City. And a lot of the principles that we discovered there and built out became the protocol and the foundation for the $50 million Lassonde Entrepreneurship Studios where students who are interested in entrepreneurship at the University of Utah can go and they live there and they have access to maker spaces and research groups and all sorts of stuff. I'm in the process of building out uh, human productivity and entrepreneurship lab built around um, some core technology that was put together by a company called BioCybernaut and Jim Hart, which does extensive, he spent 45 years fine tuning the process by which you do uh, EEG neural feedback uh, with the intention of helping people increase their alpha brainwave amplitude um, we see really high alpha brain waves in people who've been meditating for 20 to 40 years, and we've got really good scientific evidence. This is one of the few technologies that actually has been shown to increase human productivity by means of making people 50% more creative, uh, a lot, get it causing a 12-point IQ increase and a 16-point emotional intelligence increase. So people, people come out of it more so socially functional, also more intelligent and uh, you know, just better people in general. Um, right now it's very expensive and it's pretty much in the purview of kind of CEOs and Hollywood celebrities. So my goal is to uh, make it more accessible to people who don't have $50,000 to run through a week or two worth of training there. Um, a dirty little secret. So my first two years teaching entrepreneurship at Utah were basically a complete disaster. 
Um, I had a lot of uh, failures and I cared about the results. Um, so students weren't motivated. Um, they didn't believe they could be entrepreneurs. There were very few successful ventures, either profit or nonprofit. And there was almost no money made in the for-profit ventures. So things went really poorly. And I was doing pretty much what everybody else was doing and what most people still are doing in the form of entrepreneurship training. I was training people in lean startup and design thinking, kind of all the things we're supposed to do. Uh, and it just wasn't working. Um, and I had to really confront the harsh reality the truth that if the students aren't motivated and don't believe they can do it, then it doesn't make a difference what theory you give them. No theory, technique, or strategy is gonna make any difference because they're not gonna take any action to utilize any of those tools. Uh, and that was kind of a harsh wake-up call for me, but it, um, it forced me to throw out everything I was doing and take on a different approach that I now call functional entrepreneurship, where I treat people as humans and not as robots that I can program with specific techniques like lean startup techniques or something. Okay, let me dig into the case study. So this Microsoft IBM agreement has been referred to as a contractual coup that changed the course of tech history and that opened the door for Microsoft to become the dominant technology company of the PC era. This is an agreement that was hammered out mostly by Bill Gates. Um, that's him in 1984. You can imagine what he looked like three years earlier, even younger. Um, and that's Jack Sams, the IBM head of software development. When Jack showed up at Microsoft's door for an initial meeting, um, he asked the office boy where Bill Gates was, and the office boy said, I'm Bill Gates. Right? Um, so he looked very young. Um, on the standard story, IBM needed an operating system for the new personal computer they were about to release, the IBM 5150. Um, Everybody loved the CPM operating system invented by this guy, Gary Lindahl, at Intergalactic Digital Research. Um, they later changed their name to something a little less immature and took off the intergalactic part. Um, but Jack showed up at um, Gary's office. Uh, Gary was out fishing using his private airplane. Um, Jack then went to Bill Gates and Bill Gates said, hey, sure, I've got an operating system. He was lying, he did not have an operating system, but he knew where to get one, right? And that was the basis for the deal. Now that's, that story is not quite right, and I'll refine it in a second. Um, and, I'll, and I'll tell you about the historical context within which this took place. So um, back in 1977, there was a 1977 Trinity, as it was referred which consisted of these three uh, super popular personal computers, the Apple II, which um, had the distinction of having color, which was really amazing at that time, and a bigger price tag. Uh, the TRS-80, which I had when I was a kid, um, and I, I loved, I thought I wrote the world's first uh, graphical interface or graphical um, application where you'd like, you know, the keyboard goes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine, so you hit two and you draw a line up, you hit eight and it would draw a line down, and there are all sorts of bugs, but I thought I was a, a genius at the time. Uh, <laughs> then there was a Commodore PET, um, which also had the MOS 6502. Uh, most of the computers at this time ran the Z-Log Z80 chip, um, which is what Gary Tyndall's digital research uh, CPM operating system ran on, right? And most of the business software at that time ran on the CPM operating system, that's why IBM wanted that operating system for its new personal computer, which was gonna have a new chip, the Intel 886, and then the 888. Um, unfortunately, Gary was really slow to address this need in the market and didn't develop an operating system that ran on that new Intel chip. Now, Intel wanted to build a PC. Um, Atari offered to do it for them in 12 months and told IBM that if they were gonna to try to do it, it would probably take 10 years or never get done due to their huge bureaucracy. Um, in response to that, IBM initiated an independent business unit, effectively giving total autonomy to Project Chess with the goal of releasing a PC in 12 months. Now the engineers um, who became part of the Project Chess team, most of them owned Apple IIs and they wanted to build a computer that was very similar to the Apple II, at least as modular, uh, more powerful, and they're they're impressed by the Apple II in general, and so modeled what they did after that. 
uh, to a large extent. And IBM did something that it was not famous for doing, which is they outsourced almost everything. They're trying to outsource as much as possible to get the project done in 12 months and as quickly as possible. Now, as I said, they wanted the CPM operating system, uh, but none existed. Now, they knew that, I, uh, that Microsoft had partnered with Seattle Computer Products to release a hardware card, what they called a soft card, um, for the Apple II, which allowed people to put that card in the computer, and then at boot up, they could switch between the CPM operating system on the Z80 chip card or the standard Mac um, operating system. And so IBM didn't really do a whole lot of research. They just showed up at Bill Gates' store and said, hey, uh, we want your CPM operating system, and we want you to update it so it'll run on the new Intel chip. Bill Gates said, sorry, it's actually not ours. It's this guy, Gary Kindell's at Digital Research. And that's what led IBM to go to digital research's offices. Now, um, it's true that Jack Sams and a couple of other executives showed up at digital research's door, and Gary was not there. He was out in his plane. He was delivering some software. He wasn't actually fishing. Uh, but they took that as an insult that the founder couldn't even be bothered to show up for a meeting with the biggest company in the world or the biggest tech company in the world at that time. Um, and... Unbeknownst to them, it was actually standard procedure for Gary to hand off all the negotiations to his wife, Dorothy. But Jack Sams didn't know that and thought that you know he just assigned some random person to deal with him and talk to him. Uh, Dorothy, under the advice from their attorney, did not sign IBM's NDA. And they got stuck sitting in the office for like six hours just waiting for anything to happen, getting more and more pissed off. Um, eventually, they were able to get a hold of Gary. Gary told him to sign the NDA. Um, then uh, Dorothy and the attorney requested royalties um, from every copy of the OS that would be installed. IBM did not like that either, and they generally just left with a really bad feeling for the whole thing and not wanting to work with digital research at all. Um, so they talked to Bill Gates again, and Bill Gates said, sure, I'll provide you with an operating system, right? He didn't have one. Um, he didn't know where he was going to get one. He didn't know how to make one, and he didn't have the time to build one out in 12 months. That's a huge, huge undertaking. But he ultimately contracted with IBM to provide an implementation of BASIC, which he was already doing for many, many computers at that time, uh, for the OS and for uh, Fortran, COBOL, and Pascal. Now, um, I'm going to try to leave out most of the details here. I know it doesn't sound like I'm doing that. I was actually in Utah um, over the weekend, and I promised myself I'd go to some uh, Sundance films and go skiing and instead I got so fascinated by this I just keep reading reading various strands of this crazy story So Tim Patterson at Seattle computer products at that time had already been working on copying the CPM OS um, So that it would run on the new Intel chip and he called up Bill Gates and said hey I've got this operating system. It's just like CPM, right? I didn't have access to the source code, but I copied all the API calls so it looks a lot like it um, do you guys think you'd have any use for it? And Bill Gates was like, oh my God, thank you. Like, yes, I have a perfect use for it. I'm not going to tell you what it is. Bill and Paul Allen went over to CSP, Seattle Computer Products, and basically lied, or at the very least exaggerated, implying that they had dozens and dozens of companies that wanted to license their operating system, which CSP had just kind of designed on a lark. And that they would pay them 15 grand for every license that Microsoft retailed for CSP. So CSP got um, SCP got very excited. They thought they were going to make hundreds of thousands and maybe millions of dollars on this. <clears throat> As it turns out, um, Bill and Paul were lying. They just had one client, and that was IBM. Right now, they inserted a clause into the contract that said they were under no obligation to reveal who the clients are. But in the end. That got Microsoft the, the operating system with the source code for a grand total of um, $25,000. So they paid $10,000 down payment and then $15,000 for a license. Now, SCP was expecting millions and, and you know, dozens and dozens of clients. They just got this twenty-five dollars Now, um, when Bill was negotiating with Jack Sams at IBM, he told them, that he was only going to do it if IBM paid a royalty for every copy of the operating system that he provided that was installed on IBM's new PC, right? Which is fascinating, which is not that fascinating, except for the fact that um, Gary Kindall and Digital Research tried to do the exact same thing, and IBM was like, no way. So I don't know 
what Bill Gates did, but I think um, if we look at Jack Sam's comments, he says a lot of things like, hey, we were just trying to get this done as quickly as possible. We wanted to outsource as much as possible. We wanted all the software to be Microsoft's problem. Right? And so they felt more comfortable having Microsoft not just provide the famous Microsoft basic implementation, but provide everything, the operating system, the other languages and implementations, et cetera. And they got IBM to agree to this. So ultimately Microsoft acquired the operating system for 25K, um, which was getting them 200 million a year by 1991. Now later on, Seattle Computer Products was struggling financially and offers to sell an exclusive license of QDOS, right, which was the CPM version of the operating system that they wrote and licensed to Bill Gates. Um, and Gates and, and goes to Gates and says, hey, do you want an exclusive license? Right? Because Seattle Computer Products still own the license. Right? Now Gates, in this another amazing you know, negotiation, somehow inverted the deal. Right? So he was offered an exclusive license while SCP was going to maintain ownership. And he somehow convinces them that he should have complete ownership and they get one exclusive license. And they agree for $50,000, I think it was. Do I have the price there? Yeah, 50K. So ultimately for 75K, you know, they got this operating system that changed kind of the course of history and rocketed them into the stratosphere. Um, now, the 5150 was released. Um, it was a huge success. Uh, MS-DOS, as it were, PC-DOS, and PC-DOS and MS-DOS and QDOS are all the same thing. On the IBM, it was called PC-DOS. Um, now, Microsoft retained the option in the contract with IBM to continue licensing to completely different uh, vendors. So when the clone market exploded, as it did, when people realized, hey, it wasn't that hard to copy the hardware that IBM came out with, um, people were still very comfortable using the same operating system, MS-DOS, called PC-DOS on the IBM. And IBM really just didn't see the possibility that the software was gonna be most important. They thought the hardware was gonna be most important and just didn't you know, plan ahead for that possibility. Uh, when it came out, um, there are actually four different operating system choices. There's Microsoft's Basic, there's PC-DOS, i.e. MS-DOS for only 40 bucks. Gary Kendall later sued IBM, uh, actually sued IBM before the release and said, hey, you guys copied my CPM operating system. And as part of the agreement, IBM uh, said that they would include CPM if he could ever finish a version that ran on the new Intel chip. Uh, so he did six months after the release, but IBM priced it at 240, so nobody bought it, even though it was clearly a vastly superior operating system. Everybody bought MS-DOS. Um, the University of California, San Diego version of Pascal was seen as flawed in various ways, so almost nobody used that. <laughs> Okay, so now back up to the 30,000 foot view. So what made this deal possible? Well, it was Gates's ability to design and execute novel social agreements, right? This is not a tangential skill, but the most important core of all of entrepreneurial activity, I claim. Uh, the core activity of entrepreneurship is exactly this. It's the creation of novel social agreements, right? Now, uh, the most prevalent approaches to understanding and training entrepreneurs today are lean startup and design thinking, right? Um, and most people believe that one or both are the secret algorithms that unlock entrepreneurial success regardless of the product under offer and regardless of the psychological profile of the entrepreneur. So briefly, um, if you're not familiar with this stuff, customer discovery is the idea that the only thing you need to do to be a successful entrepreneur is to go out and talk to your customers and have them tell you what they want to see you build, right? what product or service they want. Uh, minimum viable product is the idea that you don't release a fully formed product, you just release some kind of piece of crap that mostly works and you don't design too much because the customer is gonna tell you all sorts of things you didn't know and force you to build out components and features that you didn't expect. And so you show them something crappy, they tell you what to do, then you build out in the correct direction. Uh, business model canvas is the technique of basically putting up a poster with about nine to 12 boxes on it. And each box has some kind of information that you have to fill out, like who your customers are, um, what uh, your revenue streams are, who your basic business partners are, what your problem is you're trying to solve. 
Um, and design thinking is the approach popularized at Stanford at the D Lab, whereby um, the most important thing is to design an amazing user interface and empathize with the user, understand what they want from that user interface and give it to them and your product will work. Now, none of these things are wrong per se. Um, my main beef with them is insofar as they're advocated as being the only way to do entrepreneurship and the golden key that unlocks the success of any entrepreneur. Um, so, Peter Thiel said about Lean Startup that it's good for making small changes to things that already exist. And uh, Thursday night, I was helping Rob with his MBA entrepreneurship class at the University of Utah. And he said that it appears that Lean Startup techniques seem to be more appropriate the shittier the product. Um, now, that's flippant, obviously. But they're both getting to this core idea that it, it's seen in expressing some dissatisfaction even in Silicon Valley about lean startup techniques that they don't really seem to work. Um, they seem to be useful in cases where there is an obvious product that people understand that might need some kind of iterative changes, but they don't work very well for more innovative products. Okay. Um, Teppo Flynn from Oxford and Todd Zanger and some others uh, released a paper last year where they said that the approach is heavy emphasis on readily observable feedback and immediately validated learning undersells the entrepreneurial scientist's central task of composing a novel theory and hypotheses, prompting instead a search for value and validation only where it's easy to observe it. So one of the problems is that studies have started coming out where they looked at people who are trained with lean startup techniques and people who are not, and we're not seeing any treatment effect, as we call it, we're not seeing any difference in their success rates, which is a bummer. Um, the NSF has even kind of given its stamp of approval to customer discovery um, under you know, lots of influence from Steve Blank, uh, the founder, you know, kind of the, the promoter of this view, uh, <clears throat> whereby um, you can go through NSF i training and you're basically taught to talk to 30 customers or talk to 60 customers. Now, I've had students who've gone through i customer discovery training, and it was impossible to get them to unlearn customer discovery. So um, I had two kids who wanted to come out with 3D printed bicycle frames, and they thought that what they had to do, and all you had to do if you were a budding entrepreneur, was go talk to customers. Now, does it make sense to go talk to customers when you have a 3D printed bike frame? No, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. You have a whole collection of engineering problems. There are thousands and thousands of bike engineers who spent you know, hundreds of man years working on engineering problems around the design of bicycle frames using various materials and carbon fiber and 532 Reynolds steel and aluminum, right? So they were just offering a different type of material which involved a lot of engineering problems. It didn't require talking to customers. Customers don't care typically about the engineering, right? They just want something that works, that they like, that performs well. Um, so they got nowhere, but the main takeaway for me was that once someone, if the first thing a student is exposed to or a young entrepreneur is exposed to is this idea that entrepreneurship is nothing but customer discovery, um, it's very hard to get them to unlearn that and teach them anything else. Uh, now, I'm not saying customer discovery is bad or lean startup is bad or design thinking is bad. I'm just saying that they're useful tools that have their place in appropriate contexts. And to think that, that all there is to entrepreneurship is lean startup is going to be a very damaging thing to learn. Now, um, Steve Jobs said it's not the customer's job to know what they want, right? So what he meant by that, I believe is that if you come up with an innovative product, there's no way you're gonna be able to get any kind of useful customer feedback, right? If you come up with, say, an iPad, which was roundly ridiculed, but started a new uh, market and was incredibly successful ultimately, um, you know, they're not gonna know what it is, they're not gonna know how to use it, they're not gonna know how it feels, they're not gonna know really what functions it can perform, right? If you're starting off with something simple, like if I'm selling pens, I can do a focus group and say, hey, you know, do you want this pen in red? and I'll get some useful feedback. Yeah, I love red, or yeah, I love purple, right? And indeed, Steve Jobs went seemingly back on his word, and when he came out with the uh, colored IMAX, he did focus groups to see which colors people like the best. 
because that's something you can actually get useful feedback about. But for innovative products, it doesn't seem to work at all. <clears throat> okay, so here's my big question. Um, would any of these techniques have been helpful with Bill Gates and his formulation of those agreements that rocketed Microsoft into the you know, biggest market share company in the world? No. I mean, what would he have done, right? Like, would he have done his business model canvas poster and been like, oh, oh yeah, I have to like kind of lie to those guys and then build this agreement. Like, there's nothing there. Like, you know, would he have figured it out by talking to his customers? Would he have, could he have built some really crappy version of the operating system? No, that would have been terrible. If you provided an operating system that didn't work, they would have just rejected it. It would have been a complete disaster. Um, so there's nothing in lean startup or design thinking that provides any kind of helpful guidance on how to either generate novel social agreements or execute them and get people to agree to them. So the core problems then are, um, as noticed by a lot of people like Peter Thiel and Tepo Flynn and Todd Zanger, lean seems to be appropriate only for innovate, iterative, you know, small, easily understood products, not innovative products. Um, no, and this is my big point, no lean or design technique is going to facilitate the construction or execution of novel social agreements. It just provides no guidance, right? It's completely tangential. Uh, but also, um, those techniques ignore the entrepreneur's psychology, I think, which I think is a, a huge, huge oversight in the history of entrepreneurship. Um, hey, Jeff, can you help me? Just let me know when it's like uh, 11, 15, 11, 10. Thanks. Um, so what is the core of entrepreneurship if it's not these things? If it's not design thinking, if it's not the standard stuff we hear from Lean, like customer discovery, well, entrepreneurship is fundamentally a social activity. Okay, this means that your venture has to integrate with diverse stakeholders, um, customers, manufacturing partners, employees, investors, retailers, state and federal ag agencies, suppliers, et cetera, all of which require agreements. Right? The most crucial core task of entrepreneurs is to build out these stakeholder agreements that advance their venture. Um, I should you know, put a caveat on this, which is that I am a firm believer that there is no kind of holy grail to entrepreneurship, and this is not one either. I'm just claiming that it's more fundamental and more important than lots of other approaches. So someone who's building an iPhone app in their basement in the dark for two years and then releases it on the App Store, is only consuming the agreement that was prefabricated by Apple, right, in order to get their software onto the App Store, and then they release it, and then maybe it's a big success, or maybe it's not, right, but they engaged in an entrepreneurial activity, and they had to design very few novel social agreements, right, so that's a counterexample to my own view, which indicates that it's not, you know, a universal approach. I don't think anything is a universal approach. Uh, some stakeholder agreements are easy to establish, right? Getting electricity from the power company. So here again, you're signing a prefabricated agreement from the power company, just like everybody else signs. It's a very simple process. You're not designing your own social agreement. But compare that to, say, Steve Jobs convincing the music industry executives to sell songs through iTunes, lest they risk the exponentially increasing hemorrhage of profits through the illegal downloading through various torrent engines like Napster, right? That required um, designing the agreement, you know, providing the product, of course, but designing the agreement, negotiating with them, and convincing them to agree to it. It required the development of a novel social agreement. Okay, so what are social agreements? Um, I teach a whole class in this. Indeed, indeed I'm teaching a whole class right now um, on this very topic, but I just want to give you the basic one sentence explanation, right? A social or stakeholder agreement is a kind of social entity, right? There are all sorts of social entities, um, a baseball game, a Senate, a marriage, a neo-Nazi party, a company, a government, a school, a dinner party. These are all social entities, right? And the atomic building blocks of any social entity like any social agreement, are rights and duties. Um, so what distinguishes, uh, say, a man from a husband? Well, once a marriage comes into existence, um, the husband and the wife, or the other husband, or whatever, 
now have rights and duties that they did not have before. So once I'm married, I have the um, right to joint assets. I have the duty to make medical decisions in the event of an emergency. If I'm in China, I've got the duty not to have more than one child in urban areas. I've got the right to gym discounts and so on and so forth. Right? A marriage is a composition of a large collection of rights and duties. What distinguishes a piece of paper from a $20 bill? Well, it's not the physical properties, right? The physical markings on that $20 bill are just an indication to remind you that it has special imaginary properties. Namely, you have the right to trade that $20 bill for a couple of burritos or JNR tacos. Um, you're under duty not to, in the United States at least, burn it or otherwise destroy it. Right? And it's not because of the physical properties. What can I do with a $20 bill in terms of its physical properties? I can burn it, I can wad it up into a spitball and throw it at somebody, but the interesting properties come from the imaginary properties we associate with that bill in the form of rights and duties. <clears throat> so it's our um, frenetic imagination that allows us to see rights and duties everywhere where none exists alone just by virtue of the physical properties, right? So King Arthur pulling the sword out of the stone counts as becoming the king of England. He gets all sorts of rights and duties from that. Um, currency has all sorts of rights and duties associated with its lawful possessor. There are various signs around town that imply rights and duties you have. So I'm under duty not to actually park my car in front of that sign, lest I want to get fined for it, and so on and so forth. So um, a social entity, like an agreement, is a web of rights and duties. Building a startup involves building out a huge web of agreements with a huge number of stakeholders. The fundamental skill needed to establish any strand in that web is the ability to create novel social agreements, typically with strangers, so as to advance your venture. And typically, young entrepreneurs and students do not know how to do this. Now, stakeholders are just our people or social entities that have taken upon themselves duties on behalf of the venture. Now, I um, talked about this with Jay Barney, and he probably promptly wrote a paper um, defining stakeholders as just people who have taken duties on behalf of the venture, right? Stakeholders and stakeholder agreements are just a kind of social entity, and all social entities are comprised of rights and duties. Okay, so executing a social agreement requires the social skills needed to interact with stakeholders, especially to get them to agree to novel contracts that they haven't seen before or haven't thought of. Right? Building social agreements requires practice building those agreements. Building a venture, as I said, requires building out a huge number of novel agreements, and this takes practice. Right. So one of the things I have my students do is to go into a Rayleigh's or a large retail chain place and overpay for some item. Okay, thanks. Um, is that hard? Yeah, that's hard because the point of sale system can't accept overpayments, right? And so the cashier calls over the assistant manager, the assistant manager calls over the manager, and they get into this long discussion, and it's a big ordeal. And some, some of you in this room have gone through that exercise, right? It's not easy. Okay, and that's the point, right? Because I'm forcing the student into a situation where they have to um, engage in social interaction in order to execute a novel social agreement. Now, a small one like this doesn't have a lot of consequences, but that's the point, right? Um, if you can't overpay a dollar for an apple, how are you gonna negotiate $1 million of distribution rights or a $1 billion discount for some kind of parts order? The problem for all of us is that we only have practice moving inside of others' social agreements every day, all day long. We go to the store, we buy something, under the implicit agreement with Walmart or the grocery store, we download some software. I never read those software agreements, but I always say I agree just so I can use the freaking software and get on with my life, right? We have all sorts of agreements that we are subject to by virtue of our employer. We are raised as children to um, do what's right and wrong according to the descriptions as provided by our parents and so on and so forth, right? Students need to learn how to build their own social agreements with others and have those other people travel within their social agreements just like Bill Gates did, right? So there are all sorts of agreements that have to be built, agreements with co-founders, you know, no matter how small your venture, you're going to have to build out agreements with co-founders or agreements with partners, manufacturing, marketing, distribution, retail, regulatory bodies, banks, all sorts of stuff. You're going to have to come up with agreements for your board of directors and many, many more 
stakeholders. Now, most young entrepreneurs are terrible at creating and executing social agreements, right? Either because they have an inability to imagine strategically advantageous agreements like Gates did, or they're bad at writing like emails, or they have bad spoken skills, or they're scared of social interactions, or they have an inability to explain someone the benefits of the agreement or an inability to emphasize with the other person's position. So these two, these problems can be broken down into two main categories. One, a failure to imagine possible agreements, imagine the components of the agreement that's beneficial for them, or two, just the lack of social skills needed to close on the agreement. Now, in my experience, um, though these are analytically distinct, the medicine that cures them is the same thing. Um, namely, practice executing novel social agreements because once they get practice doing that, they're no longer scared. Once they're no longer scared, all of a sudden they can imagine all kinds of social agreements that they couldn't imagine before just because they didn't think they were possible before because they were way too scary. Uh, what's the time, Jeff? 13? Okay, so I'm going to play you just a couple of minutes um, from Jia Zhang. Hopefully we can hear it. This is what the blog looked like. Um, day one, <laughs> borrow $100 from, from stranger. So this is where I went to where I was working. I, uh, I came downstairs and saw this big guy sitting behind a desk. You know, he, he looked like a security guard. So I just approached him, and I was just going, I was just walking in. That was the longest walk in my life. I just hair at the back of my neck standing up. I was sweating, and my heart was pounding. And I got there and said, hey, um, sir, can I borrow $100 from you? <laughs> and he looked up, he's like, no. <laughs> Why? And I just said, I said, no, I'm sorry. Then I turned around and just ran. <laughs> I felt so embarrassed. But because I filmed myself, so that night I was watching myself getting rejected, I just saw how scared I was. I looked like this kid in Sixth Sense. I saw dead people. <laughs> But then I saw this guy, he, you know, he, he wasn't that menacing, he was a chubby, lovable guy, you know? And, and, and he even asked me why. In fact, he invited me to explain myself. I could have said many things. I could have explained, I could have negotiated. I, I didn't do any of that. All I did was run. I felt, wow, this is like a microcosm of my life. Every time I feel the slightest rejection, I would just run as fast as I could. And you know what? The next day, no matter what happens, I'm not going to run. I'll stay engaged. Day two, request a burger refill. <laughs> That's where I finished, uh, went to a burger joint, I finished lunch, and I went to the cashier and said, hey, can I get a burger refill? <laughs> and he was all confused. I was like, what's a burger refill? <laughs> I said, well, just like a drink refill, but what's a burger? <laughs> and he said, sorry, we don't do a burger refill, man. So this is where rejection happened. I, I could have run, but I stayed. I said, well, I love your burger, I love your, your joint, and if you guys do a burger refill, I will love you guys more. <laughs> and he said, well, okay, I'll tell my manager about it. Well, maybe we'll do it, but sorry, we can't do this today. Then I left. And by the way, I don't think they've ever done burger refill. <laughs> I think they're still there. Um, but the life and death feeling I was feeling the first time was no longer there, just because I stayed engaged, because I didn't run. I said, wow, great, I'm already learning things. Great. And then day three, getting Olympic donuts. Um, th this is where my life was turned upside down. <laughs> I went to a Krispy Kreme. It's a donut shop, in, mainly in the southeastern part of the United States. Um, I'm sure they have some here, too. Uh, and I went in and said, can you make me donuts that look like Olympic symbols? Basically, you interlink five donuts together. <laughs> I mean, there's no way they could say yes, right? The donut maker took me so seriously. <laughs> so she put out a paper, started jotting down uh, uh, the colors and the rings. It's like, um, how could they make this? And then, uh, 15 minutes later, she came out with a box that looked like Olympic rings. <laughs> and I was so touched, and I, I just couldn't believe it. And uh, that video got over five million views on YouTube. <laughs> the world couldn't believe that either. And <laughs> I'm going to cut it there. Uh, lots of cute examples. Now, these seem weird and silly, uh, but they're actually fantastic exercises to run young entrepreneurs through. 
right? I have them do things like overpay for an apple, plant a flower in a stranger's backyard, borrow hundred dollars from a stranger, be a greeter in Starbucks, uh, <clears throat> make some kind of profit selling anything of increasingly more difficult amounts, ask for a burger refill, uh, go out to dinner at a restaurant and then ask if you can cook your own meal in the, their kitchen, all sorts of weird things like that, right? So these are um, peculiar little exercises, but they push the students' comfort zones and give them extensive practice closing on novel social agreements where there's little at stake, right? Which is exactly the kind of practice most of them need. Now, not all of them need it, right? If you wind up with a Bill Gates in your class who is, you know, sharp and articulate and fearless and willing to negotiate anything, um, they don't need this kind of training, right? But that's precisely the point. You've got to individualize the training to the kind of entrepreneurs you're dealing with and you've got to individualize the tools the ones that they actually need at that point in their project. Okay, so what made that agreement possible? Well, it was Gates's ability to repeatedly craft the contract terms to his advantage, depending on which stakeholder he was dealing with and getting those stakeholders to agree to them, right? And it was also the fact that he had really good communication and personal skills and persuasion skills to close on these agreements. You know, Steve Jobs was famously no different. They talk about the Steve Jobs reality distortion field, you'd walk you know, close to him and all of a sudden you, you know, begin to believe anything that he said. Okay, what do you need to make a $100 billion deal like Gates did? Well, first you need some practice constructing and executing small novel social agreements with people you don't know, and you need the basic social skills to engage, articulate, and persuade your stakeholders to assent to that agreement. Um, and the practice works, it turns out. So when I switched over to this functional entrepreneurship, these are the results of, uh, I won't go through them in detail, but a couple of my last undergrad classes, um, I had 29 projects that with only 64 students. Um, they made about $214,000 during the semester, and then they made much, much more after the semester, especially this one uh, group that did uh, Iranian caviar export. They made about 1.2 million. I've had a number of products licensed uh, to companies, so the kids just came up with ideas, licensed them to companies, and then collected royalties for the rest of their lives. Uh, I got a million stories, I won't um, go through many of them there, but the point is that once um, you run the students through the training where they get practice doing these odd little exercises where they're negotiating novel social agreements, they're then much more comfortable going out to the CS department and finding a co-founder to handle the technical parts of their contract, going out and finding a mentor to put on their board of advisors and building an agreement about how that's gonna work and so on and so forth. None of that stuff seems very scary anymore. Okay, so I call all this functional entrepreneurship, um, which is based on the idea that entrepreneurs are not robots, that you can have run some specialized program like lean or customer discovery or design thinking that's magically gonna work in all contexts. Um, they are humans whose own psychology, dispositions, and social skills can't be ignored as factors in understanding their entrepreneurial success. So it's based on the idea that the core focus is on developing the ability to construct and execute novel social agreements um, that offer strategic advantage, and it requires an individualized approach, right? So this is a nod to functional medicine and functional training where we've recognized that it's important to look at the individual as an individual with very specific needs in order for them to get better or in order for them to succeed in entrepreneurship. Um, it sees any intervention as an intervention into a large set of related functional social systems, and it prioritizes results first rather than a religious adherence to some kind of methodology, even in the face of evidence that it's not working. Okay, and that's it. Thanks for your time and attention. What, uh, what time is it? 21. 21, okay. So maybe we'll take um, a couple of questions, but we're just about out of time. Yeah, what do you mean like? Um, <coughs> got it, yeah. Okay, so um, yeah, in, so in the business sciences, we call that legitimacy. Um, legitimacy is incredibly important, and you can see that, so if, Elon Musk makes an announcement that he's going to start a candy bar company. Like he will have a million investors and people flocking to him and asking what's going to happen. If I say the same thing, people are going to keep walking across the campus, right? So legitimacy is very important in 
getting you to the point where people are willing to engage with you and negotiate with you and build out social agreements. And then there's a question of, you know, there's a big fundamental question about how to establish social legitimacy, and that's a more interesting and harder question. Yeah. So right now you said that um, this could be the Yeah, so we've got um, the two most successful incubators are Y Combinator and uh, Techstars. Um, I'm really good friends with Amish Schwarzfeld, the managing director at Techstars Austin, who has metric companies to over $1 billion in revenue. And you know, he and I are in perfect agreement, so they don't do the startup there. They don't do the design thinking. Um, Amos just came out with a book um, about customer identification, which is a very detailed look at how to figure out who your customers are, who they should be, what they look like, and stuff. And that's very different from the approach that customer discovery takes, which is essentially handing over the design and the construction of your product or service to the opinions of your customers. Um, and so most of the success we seem to see from the incubators are really good, appears to be due to uh, both peer mentoring and network effects. So Y Combinator has a deep um, and wide collection of contacts in the industry, and they've had so many successes, um, you know, Reddit, many others, that um, lots of VCs are willing to flock to them, and lots of mentors are willing to flock to them, provide all sorts of advice and guidance. That seems to be um, one of the key things that make things work. Uh, Silicon Valley is mostly now unimpressed with Lean Startup, and if Lean Startup worked, we should have seen you know, more impressive results now after 15 years or something like that. Um, again, it's not that Lean sucks or design thinking sucks. Um, building an amazing design is really important in some circumstances, um, especially if your product is relatively similar to others and you need to make it stand out by virtue of a much better user interface. Uh, and there are times when you do need to talk to customers and get their feedback on stuff, especially if it's stuff that they are able to provide feedback about, right? But um, a lot of people, including the people that promote lean and design thinking, often promote it as entrepreneurship is customer discovery, entrepreneurship is future design. And that's just, um, it's just going to do a lot more harm than good. Okay, I think we are out of time. I don't know how to take questions from the people who are there <clears throat> remotely. So sorry, guys, but you can get in touch with me directly. Thanks for your attention. Thank you.